All right. Our next speaker, uh, Eric Svedang, uh, I think is known for making games with very beautiful worlds, uh, but also games with very malleable worlds. So uh, Eric's first game, Blueberry Garden, which uh, won the IGF Grand Prize in 2009, uh, is a puzzle platformer where you collect seeds and you grow trees and the trees bear fruit. And then if you eat some of the fruit, it actually moves the fruit. Uh, and, and free game in a kind of unprecedented way. So just in my personal playthrough of that game, let's see, I, I turned a door into a teleporter, uh, I turned a trash can into a package delivery system, uh, I turned a cup of coffee into a bathtub. And, you know, I, it, it was an experience that, that in this kind of unprecedented level of permissiveness sort of blew my mind and I, you know, I, I, I played the game and then for, for two or three days afterwards, I felt like just for a second, just for a second, I, I felt like I actually understood what the internet was <laughs> and, and maybe what, what computers can do. It felt different uh, for a couple of days just to sit and work on my computer. And you know, so, so that, I mean, I really recommend the experience of playing this game if you haven't played it. Um, but the other thing that kept going through my mind after playing Else Heartbreak was just this question of how can you make a game that's so permissive, but that still doesn't break, where you can still tell a story. And it's just like, that was just something that I, that I have amazing respect for, because I thought to myself, I have no idea how I would go about uh, designing that. Uh, and so I'm absolutely uh, overjoyed that we've got Eric here to actually explain that for us and give us a taste of how you would design a game like that. Eric Spadang. Thanks a lot. I'll do my best to explain. Um, I don't know. Um, yeah. So thanks a lot for inviting me here. Also, this is the most intimidating audience I've ever sp <laughs> spoken in front of. Uh, anyway, so I made this game uh, together with four excellent and awesome friends. Uh, they made all the, all the art and sound for the game, and I did design and writing and a lot of the programming. Um, and we started this project five years ago, um, roughly. And I was super excited to start working on this game because it was kind of this chance to explore some really big ideas that I was super interested in. Uh, and I'm trying to sum them up in two categories, kind of. So uh, the game is kind of two experiments in one game. So the, the first kind of idea I wanted to explore was this idea of a game that is about programming. And um, what I mean with this is a couple of things. So first of all, I didn't want to focus on like the geeky part of programming. I wanted to kind of convey more of this fantastic thing with programming. Like it's this property of the universe where we can compute things and there's something that let us do that. It's kind of amazing. And it's kind of the closest thing to magic I can think of. So that's really cool. I wanted, wanted to convey that feeling in the game. Um, I was also very fascinated, fascinated by this idea of self-modifying code. Um, and I wanted the game to allow the player to change the code of the game from within itself. Um, so that's a big part of the game. Um, I also really wanted to create these matrix-like moments where you discover this fact that you can modify the game probably. So I didn't want that to be like known from the beginning. It was something that you should get to know inside a game and it should make your head spin like several times <laughs> over and over. Um, also, I had this theory that Maybe programming could be like a really good puzzle system um, because it allows people to solve problems in so many different ways, like really personal and creative ways, in a way that normal puzzle systems maybe not always do. So that was some theories five years ago. Um, also, I wanted to experiment more with interactive storytelling. And like Bennett said, I made Blueberry Garden, and it was kind of an experiment in trying to 
tell a story only through gameplay. So there's no text or anything in that game. It's just a character moving around in a world. And this time I wanted to be a bit more pragmatic. So I wanted to mix kind of uh, the simulation part with actual scripted parts and pre-decided events. Um, and I also wanted the story to be about the kind of things you can read about in a book or look like see in a movie. So I wanted it to be these kind of human things. Um, and I wanted all of this to take place inside a simulated world where like things felt like they were actually alive. Uh, and I wanted it to be possible to pretend that you actually live in this world. So in a lot of games, when you come to a place and it's nice, if you try to actually live there, you, you can't live there because things don't work. I wanted them to work so you could pretend that you're just living in this world and ignore everything else. So that was the other part of the experiment. So in the beginning of the project five years ago, there were a lot of questions, of course, how to do all this. Like, is it really clever to combine these two giant ideas into one game? Maybe it's better to make two games. Um, yeah. And how challenging should it be? Like, a game about programming can be extremely hard, as you can imagine. Um, and also just saying that you want a simulation that doesn't make for a simulation. You have to figure out how it's going to work. And also, of course, with the hacking of the world, like how much should you be able to hack? That's something that you have to find out just by making the game. And of course, when you modify the game from within, like what's the game going to do about it? Is it going to understand what you're doing? That's also a, a question. OK. So I don't have time to show that much of the game, but I'm going to try to show a little three-minute trailer from the game, just so that if you haven't seen the game, you get some sense of how it ended up. And then I'm going to go into more like the result of this research.
Okay, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so on to the results. Um, so the first thing that's obvious when you play the game is that it's extremely open and free. Uh, you can basically ignore anything anyone says or tells you to do and uh, go the other direction or don't do anything at all. Um, and the reason I wanted to try to make a game this way was that I wanted to allow for these uh, events of chance that often happen in our olden lives. Like we meet like a new friend or our girlfriend or something at a bar for the first time and for some reason you ended up there, but it wasn't like a designer who decided that you were going to be there. And I wanted to try to create those moments in the game, these chance moments. Uh, and the only th way I could come up with doing that was by letting the player actually have a lot of freedom and try to make these cool things happen anyway. Uh, the problem, of course, with this is that uh, you get a ton of randomness from this, like the person goes out of the house and maybe they turn left or they turn right and there is no obvious uh, direction they're gonna go. Uh, so people get extremely different experiences out of this. And um, basically at every point in the story, some people get lost. So some poor bastard is gonna make like the wrong choice 100 times in a row and it's gonna make totally no sense the whole game. Um, <laughs> that's a problem. Um, also, pacing is really hard, and that's something you can see in reviews of the game and when people talk about the game online. Like, some people have gotten to like important events after an hour, and for some people it takes eight hours, and that's also confusing to them. Um, so, I like to see this kind of game design as kind of like a very high risk kind of game for me as a designer where I play with the players and the good thing is when you get this right and it happens for the player, it's a really cool experience. Uh, of course, when it fails, um, it's not good for the player. Um, okay. Um, another key part of the game is exploration. It's very much tied to the freedom, of course. So it's a very open world where you can basically go anywhere you want from the beginning. And it's very three-dimensional. You can look at it from different angles and so on and find out a lot from exploring it. Um, it also has the internet that you kind of saw in the trailer with all the colored lines that creates these kind of extra connection between things that are far apart in 3D space but close in the virtual space. Um, it also has a realistic uh, tourist map that you saw that's uh, as useless as normal tourist maps. Um, and I mean, this is kind of dubious design choices maybe, but I was really interested in making them. And I think one interesting thing that came out of this is that the game really, like it's designed more for people who are good at these things in reality rather than in games. So people who expect a game will get super confused, while someone who is like an avid traveler is gonna have not so much trouble when they play the game. And uh, there's some satisfaction for me in, in making that kind of game. Um, okay, so the simulation. Uh, the basic goal of the simulation in the game is to create like this kind of backdrop, a pulse uh, of the city. So the main way I do that is through daily routines. People go to work, they go home, they go partying, stuff like that. And this changes throughout the story a bit, but that's the basic idea. And it also allows for some reasoning about things in the game world. So like if you want to meet someone and you know they work somewhere and you know where they live, you know they're going to walk past this point maybe. And you can do that kind of reasoning. Also, if you put something down, it's going to stay there, even though the world is huge and has tons of scenes. Everything is kind of persistent in that sense. Um, and the whole world, it doesn't care about like who's the avatar and stuff like that. So everything is just objects but that's used by characters. So that's some of the things that often get cut out of games, but uh, to me, I wanted to try to 
get this stuff right in that sense. Okay, so just to be a bit more concrete, so there is a cafe that you can go to, and people go there at different times of the day. Someone who works late will come in, uh, like around lunch, lunch and stuff like that. And uh, there is a person that you can buy coffee from, and other people buy coffee from him. And if you drink up your coffee and put it on the table, he's gonna come and get a cup, clean it off the table. People are gonna go back to their seat and so on. Uh, and this is all pretty nice to look at, but like I said in the beginning, it, this wasn't like the sole goal. I, I didn't want to make this the only part of the game. This was just like the background of the game. I still wanted this kind of scripted, like well-crafted thing on top of the simulation. Um, so I'm going to get to that later. Um, let's see how I'm doing. Okay. Yeah. So I'm moving on a bit here. So another part of the game, of course, is actions. Like it's a point and click adventure game. So the actions you can do are a very important part of like the interface for the player to kind of acting out the story. And um, I also think that, especially in adventure games, like the actions you can do are a bit underused. Like we try to add a lot of actions that let the player act in the game world. And as far as I can tell, this is actually working pretty nicely. Uh, so like, you go to a bar and you buy a cocktail and you, people actually stand and sip the drink and kind of get into the groove of being at the bar. And like, if you get into a room where the water is running, you have this urge to turn it off and you do that. And if it's like this little mini, mini story there. And like, you're really angry at some computer and you go outside and you kick a lamp and it makes a satisfying noise. Like, these are little things that you might actually remember after playing the game. And they're part, like, they don't matter that much, but they are ways of acting out something. And I think that's something worth exploring a lot. Another more controversial action you can do in the game is sleep. Um, you can't go to the bathroom, but it almost made it in there, I guess. Um, <laughs> so uh, you can sleep in beds. And if you don't sleep, you're going to fall, fall on the ground and sleep there. And um, this, of course, is annoying, but it's also good for role playing, especially since you're playing this character who moves away from ho home and goes out partying and you don't know where the hotel is. So you're running around in the middle of the night and you get more and more tired. And eventually you crash on the ground and you wake up and some homeless person is standing there, talk like wondering wh what you're doing there and stuff like that. Um, and it's kind of emergent story telling in that sense. It also has a more important role, kind of, uh, and that's because sleeping makes you want to go back to the hotel uh, where you live. And this kind of indirect control of the player is really all I have as a game designer to make people do stuff. So by, by for example, adding sleepiness to the character when I want them to go home to the hotel, um, I can do that, and then I can place some character at the hotel, and that way I can make them actually meet this person that's, that I want them to meet. So that's kind of a sneaky way of using this system to make the story a bit smoother. Okay, so the hacking, I'm not going to go too much into the hacking part uh, because of time limits, but um, we made a programming language that's made to be easy to use. Um, and by using this language, you can modify different objects in the game. So, like, there are floppy disks, there are lamps. If you, yeah, Bennett talked about these things. Like, you can hack tons of different things. Basically, all the interactive things can be modified in some some way. Um, and like I said in the beginning, I was really looking forward to making puzzles with with this thing. Uh, what turned out to happen was that uh, when I started working on the story, I didn't want to kind of stop the story from happening by adding tons of puzzles. Uh, so I ended up with very few puzzles that actually blocked the story. Uh, so what I did instead was that if you fail at some challenge or puzzle, you the story still goes on, but it's a story about you failing. So people might get mad at you and stuff like that. Um, and 
This leads to a game that's kind of a tragedy for people who are not good. And <laughs> I think that's fine. Like, as several people have talked about already, uh, like, I think failure and these things, like, it doesn't have to be a power fantasy. Like, the whole game, the whole game, you can't really win the game from a story standpoint. Like, um, this is going to be a sad story for uh, almost anyone who plays the game, and I think that's more interesting. Um, yeah. Um, also, since the game world is so rich, people come up with their own challenges really easily, and that's much better because then they will actually find a challenge that, that is good for their skill level. Like, a, a person who knows how to program will be able to do some weird shit while some new programmer is just gonna, or a player has never programmed, is just gonna do like the basic stuff. And that's good. Okay, so I'm gonna switch gears a bit and go into the more scripting part of the story a little bit. So I also have an example of our scripting language for story. It's what you would imagine. Um, it's just branching dialogue and I wanted to come up with something fancier from the beginning, but I couldn't come up with anything better than branching dialogue. So uh, I think it's really actually good to work with branching dialogue if you want to create like high quality dialogue and have like comedy and so on, because you can actually you know what has been said. So it really helps. Um, so using this, I uh, started working on the story and. I used what I call the graph model, which is a fancy way of saying uh, this, <laughs> which is uh, chaos. Uh, so uh, this Instagram photo is of me trying to uh, make sense of what I had written down in the form of this scripting language. And all the arrows are like activations of other parts of the story. And I was really confused, so I started drawing a bird instead. Um, <laughs> and basically anything can hap happen at any time here. It's really confusing. And you have to read through everything very carefully to, to know what's going on. And you can't reason about it, which is a problem. So after, I don't know, a year, two years working with this, I came up with something I call the sequencer model. Some people here might have invented this on their own also. Um, but I didn't know about it, so I reinvented it. Um, so it's basically, it basically works like this. So each character here is like the instrument in an orchestra or, you know, garage band or whatever, some kind of sequencer program. And then at the top, there are different events in the story. And they could happen in different order, but usually they are kind of ordered in some way. And when an event happens, all the characters who are affected by that event change their whole file with like their dialogue. And as you can tell, this is way, way easier to reason about. And you can actually see a lot of things just by glancing at it. And it guarantees that every character has exactly one piece of story, which is a very nice thing to know. And you can reason about order, like I said. So I can recommend that approach. Um, if yeah, come up to t and talk to me more if you want to know more about the backsides of it. Also, um, okay. So moving on, uh, there is conversation, of course, in the game, branching dialogue, um, and I just have some kind of ideas about how to make interesting dialogue um, that I'm going to share. Hopefully, it's something that helps someone. Um, so the first thing I think is that you want to put the player in a curious mode. Like a lot of games just put dialogue up without ensuring that players actually want to know something. And I think that's a problem because then it just becomes this obstacle. Uh, so that's the first step. And when you've done that, you want to make sure that this information or some of it is available only through the dialogue. So you actually are interested in what people are saying. You can't get the information afterwards by looking at a map or something. So we don't add any marks to your map or anything after you talk to people. Um, and in the same vein, you don't want to allow people to just go back and get the information later always. 
Like sometimes you want to be kind of evil and not let them know stuff against you. They actually have to read or listen if you have like audio. Um, also, I think it's very important to enable people to role play, even when it doesn't matter too much. Um, people l like to role play, and if you have dialogue, that's kind of the reason you have dialogue that you want people to role play. So just having different ways of answering questions and so on is really fun. I also think there should be ways to getting out of long winding converse conversations. Um, that's something I try to add in like these little escape hatches where you want to get out of the conversation. Um, and finally, the most important thing I think is to try to mind read the players. So you try to figure out what they want to say. And the way you know if you do this right is when you play test the game, people will talk out loud like what they want to say before the options come up. And if the option comes up that they just said, they're probably going to click on the, that choice. And then you did it right. And if, I mean, the good thing with playtesting is that you can kind of cheat here, so you can add in those options later. Um, so that's highly, highly recommended. OK. Yeah, I think I'm, I managed to squeeze everything in in my time. Great, OK. So yeah, I'm nearing the end of my slides. Um, I, I kind of struggled to come up with some way to like sum up my design philosophy uh, because that seems like something you should do. And I came up with this buzzword, fragile game design. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> this is what I'm into. It, <laughs> it might sound a bit negative, but um, the thing is, uh, I think fragile things are beautiful, and I think a lot of art is at its core very fragile. You know, you're watching your favorite movie with the wrong person, and they're not enjoying it, and it just feels really bad. Like a lot of things are very fragile, um, and I mean, this game is so fragile. Like. You can hack the game so that it breaks totally. Um, you can make dumb choices all the time uh, and basically ignore everything. Um, there's tons of things to pay attention to and things, tons of things that you can forget because it's not written down anywhere. Um, and also, it's really easy to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and miss out on tons of stuff. Um, so this sounds pretty bad. Um, but I think there are ways to work around this that make it somewhat more of a real realistic way to design games. So, I mean, the main way is to make a lot of your game optional and being okay with one player missing out on tons of things. That's kind of obvious, but it's also heartbreaking, uh, of course. Um, yeah, and also I think an important part, particularly in this game, is that Hacking the game should break it. Like It wouldn't be fun if you hack the game and nothing happens. And it's the same thing with ignoring people in the story and stuff like that. Like It should have an effect. Um, and I think people, like normal players, don't really think this through. So they kind of expect everything to work even though they're kind of playing the way that is obviously going to break stuff. Um, so. Kind of my wish is that people like that it would be okay to design games where the game is kind of a collab collaboration between me as the designer and the player, and I don't have to babysit them, but more like we together we create this story together, and that players would be like more interested in this challenge. Like let's create a good story together, and I, I know that's a lot to ask for, but. Um, that's kind of what I tried to do here, and um, yeah, I hope some of you might do this, but in a better way, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay, so I have just a f little bit extra. Um, so in case you want to check out uh, the story scripting language and the programming language. They are both open source on my GitHub. Um, and 
there's also a lot more information at these things. Uh, <laughs> so take a photo if you want, or ask me afterwards. Um, yeah, that's it. Okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, I think we are running a little into the break, but we've got time for uh, like one or one and a half questions. If there's somebody in the in the audience, can I see one? No. Oh, yep, over there. Oh, so it's part of this of your save, basically. Like, if you modify one cup of coffee. You only modified that cup of coffee. Um, all the other cups of coffee are still normal. Oh, yeah, then they are reset, yes. We have another one, Matt? So it seems, when I was young, I had a friend who got a Macintosh, the first Macintosh, and he put the hard drive in the trash and then emptied the trash. <laughs> and then he didn't have a hard drive and had to like, get the computer reset. Uh, you can't do that anymore with computers. We've gotten to the point now where like, they're, you're expected to be able to interact with them in sort of a safe way. And I think games are largely that way. But as a programmer, you get used to the idea that you can write infinite loops that are going to break your computer. Or if you're doing C++, do even crazier stuff with your computer. It seems like you're trying to get some of that experience for a player. Like, this system isn't safe. You can break this system, especially with the hacking and breaking the game thing. And so was that w what you were going for a little bit there? Or was getting that sort of fear and power into it? Sure, and I mean, in a way, you run into like the halting problem because anything you put into try to stop the player from ruining the game, they're just gonna be able to work around that work around. And if you stop that, they're gonna work around that because you've given them this powerful tool that's too powerful for their own good, basically. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, thanks very much, Eric. <laughs> <laughs>